Well, let's spend some time in church today listening to one or maybe all seven words of the clock. And I wonder what percentage really understood the great mystery. For we are told that when they came to the place called the Scar, where they crucified. When they came to the place called the Scar. Where is it? And what kind? We cannot fix the cross in time or locate it in space. And it's a very great mistake in interpretation to ignore the out and out character of the supernatural nature of the crucifixion. In fact, all the great events in the life of Jesus Christ. Let me share with you my own personal experience to show you you cannot locate it in space and you cannot fix it in time. Remember, he's only fulfilling scripture. And the scripture is the Old Testament. We turn now to a song, the 42nd Psalm, that was written hundreds of years before. If you listen carefully to the tenth, you will see you can date it. It begins as the heart panted after the water book, so panted my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirst of seek and thirst for God, for the living God. Now he said, these things I remember. When I went to the throne and led them in procession to the house of God, a mother in festive God. And let me share with you my own experience of that song. And you try to fix it in time or locate it in space. This night in question, I was leading an enormous crowd, a gay crowd, a very festive crowd, a huge mother and leading them to the house of God. And as we walked in this gay manner, a voice rang out from outer space. And the voice said, And God walked with me. A woman at my side, to my right, she questioned the voice. <coughs> and she said, If God walks with us, where is it? And the voice replied, at your side. She looked to her left and looked into my face. And she became hysteric. It struck her so funny. So again she addressed the voice. And she said, you mean never is God? And the voice answered, yes in the act of waiting. Then the voice spoke in the depths of my own soul, and no one heard it but the speaker. And the voice said to me, I laid myself down within you to sleep. And as I slept, I dreamed a dream. I dreamed, and I knew exactly what the end of that sentence would be. He is dreaming that he's I. But I became so emotional, moved by the voice speaking in the depths of my own being, that I began to return to this level. And as I returned, my hand, my head, the right side, 
and the soles of my two feet <coughs> were nailed by his vortex. Here was a vortex, a vortex, a vortex, a vortex, and each foot a vortex. No way did it happen. The taint is past. I laid myself down within you to sleep. And as I slept, I dreamed a dream. Now it begins, these things I remember. If I remember them, then it is past. As Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Then he stated, From now on, I recognize no one from a human point of view. Even though I once recognized Christ from a human point of view, I recognize him thus no longer. Paul, far from denying Christ, no one more supported his vision than Paul did. But Paul knew the whole thing was supernatural. When it pleased God to reveal his son in me, I conferred not with flesh and blood. The drama is a supernatural drama taking place in the soul of man. In the beginning of time, the crucifixion took place. That's when God became as we are, that we may be as he is. God became man, that man may become God. And that was in the very beginning of time. That was the crucifixion. The crucifixion is actually God becoming man. That is Calvary. What we speak of as Bethlehem is man becoming God. You cannot date them. But we have dated them, well, for church reasons. <coughs> and today we speak of Good Friday as a day that actually separates before and after. When Good Friday took place in the beginning of time, Bethlehem takes place at any moment in time. When it comes, it will come suddenly, unexpected. No one will know when he is born within you and you become God. For when you say to me, <coughs> and as I dreamed, I dreamt a dream, I dream, and I exactly what he's going to dream. He is dreaming that he died. And when the dream of life is over, I will awake as the dreamer. But then he is awake, and I will be awake as the one who so loved me that he actually became me and took upon himself all the weaknesses and all the limitations of man. And they are unnumbered. So this day called Good Friday, you cannot date any attempt to date it and to ignore the altogether supernatural character of the event called the crucifixion. And try to explain it in some naturalistic way is to labor in vain. God actually became exactly as you are, and he is dreaming your life. So the dreamer in you is your own wonderful human imagination. That is God. Man is all imagination. And God is man. And exists in us and we in him. The eternal body of man is the imagination. And that is God himself. The divine body, Jesus. That's the divine body. And within us we beat him morning, noon and night by the misuse of our imagination. So here, the suffering Christ that they spoke of today, 
And all the statements that they are stated today are taken from the Old Testament. The first two from Luke, the third from John, the fourth from Matthew. Then we go back to John for two more, and then we aim with Luke. So in the beginning, forgive them all, Father. They know not what they do. Not one really knows, for he's in a dream. And the Father is putting him through the furnaces and suffering with him. Because as you suffer, if you didn't have an imagination, you couldn't suffer. Remove imagination and you can cut yourself in pieces and you couldn't suffer. So God in man is the suffering one. He actually suffers with everything that man thinks only he suffers. So someone will say to me, it isn't God who is suffering in my case. I am feeling the pain. I said, who? I said, I am. I said, that's his name. That's God's name forever and forever. Go to the people and say, I am. Ascension. For this is my name for all generations. There is no other name that he has. So in the Gospel of John, it is always I am. Throughout the entire Gospel. He is affirming, I am the door. I am the shepherd. I am the vine. I am the true water, the living water. All these things, the I am is speaking of, which is all in man. So here this night, millions of seven have celebrated this day. And they thought they did God a service, which is all right. It's good to do something of that nature. So they went out and they spent an hour, two hours, and spent three hours. And they heard these words from the cross. <coughs> and thought the interpretation given by the minister was the interpretation. The simple word. A word spoken of is not a word, but a completed sentence. It could be just, the shortest one is, I first. Well, that's taken from the psalm. In the very end, quoting now the 31st psalm, but it's put into the mouth of Jesus on the cross. And he says, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. The completed verse in the 31st psalm, into thy hands I commit my spirit. Thou hast redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. So he said, I've come only to fulfill scripture. And so all these words on the cross are taken from the Old Testament. And you cannot think it. These things I remember. For may I tell you, when it happened to me, memory returned. Walking in that procession to the house of God, memory returned. But when did it happen? Not on earth. Not here. When did she say to the voice, if he walks with us, where is he? When did the voice answer? At your side. And when she became his telegram, looking into my face, when what? And where what? You can't fix it in time. And you can't locate it in space. Yet I can tell you it happened as far as I am concerned. In an objective sense. They all seem objective to me. And the voice was objective also the last one. Because everyone heard the voice. She heard it and could question the voice. Yet in the very end, when it spoke only from within me, I laid myself down within you to sleep. A deliberate decision on the part of my father. And the purpose of laying himself down within me to sleep is to transform me into himself as God the Father. That's his duty. To do it, he has to put me through the furnaces. I try you in the furnaces of affliction. For my own sake, I do. For my own sake. For how should my name be profaned? I will not give my glory unto another. And glory and I are identical in Scripture. I will make my glory to pass before them. And when I pass by, so he identifies glory with the I. So to give me himself, which is his glory, he has to try me in the furnaces of affliction. And so I go through hell in the shadow. But when he awakes, then I awake as the one 
who sold out when he gave himself up. So this is the great story that took place, not took place, but I mean that we celebrate today as having taken place 2,000 years ago. <coughs> and it's not so at all. This is an eternal drama that is forever taking place. Something to be done absolutely and continuously without dating. You can't date it. It has no reference to time. No reference at all to anything taking place there. It is always taking place. And so tonight, one, two, or maybe all of you, who knows? It will be his will this night that he unfolds himself within you and reveals himself as you. Then it's his will. But no one can earn it. No one can force it. It will come in you see when the Father reveals himself. When people say, I saw God. You don't see God. God makes himself seen. You never see him. He makes himself manifest. If after the whole thing unfolded within me, the few who have seen me unveil, it's not because they came upon me and caught me by surprise. It was my deliberate choice to make myself see. It's entirely up to me to make myself mad after the whole thing unfolded with him. You don't catch anyone by surprise. I've made you a promise. I will keep that promise. I have kept it to at least a dozen of That I have made myself seem vital. But you do not catch me by surprise. And so when these events unfold within the soul of man, it is God unfolded. Because we are told, rouse thyself. Why sleepest thou, O Lord? Awake! Do not cast us off forever. But he will never cast you off. For it seems so long when you are eager for another to go back to the 42nd Psalm. <coughs> he likens the little heart. Now heart is not H-E-A-R-T. It's the little palm, the little deer. H-A-R-T. As the heart panted after the water, so panted my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Now he tells us he will the same of famine on the world. He will not be a famine for bread or a thirst for water, but for the hearing of the word of God. When that thirst possesses you, Nothing in this world can quench you but an experience of God. And that was an experience of God. When I heard his voice coming from without first, then from within, and I knew the art of the dreamer within was God. And I do not separate the dreamer within from the eye when I wake. It's the same thing. I can have a daydream as I have a night dream. But that daydream and the night dreamer are one and the same. So if I can conjure in the think of an eye in dream, the night dream, the most wonderful picture, the most marvelous bridge of incident, and then at the spring, well then the same thing is true when I wake. If I only know that the eye when I wake is the one with the eye that is dreaming. So I can now set my goal in this world. Name the aim. Go to the aim. Experience the aim as though it were true. And let the dreamer in me build the bridge of incident that will lead me from where I am now to the fulfillment of that daydream. When I get there, it will happen in the most normal, natural manner. It will externalize itself in my world. And I'll give all credit to the being within who is completing the dream. And when he completes it, these things will happen. This, like spoke of earlier, preceding the resurrection. The resurrection comes suddenly. And it's not from some cemetery. It's all within your own skull. When they came to the place which is called the skull, there they crucified him. In your skull, 
So go to bed, perfectly normal person, as you've done year after year, for as many years as you've lived, night after night. And something strange will happen while you're asleep. You will feel a vibration that you've never known before. The strangest vibration. And you may interpret it as I interpreted mine. I thought I know nothing of the human form. I know nothing of this body. And I thought to myself, well now this is it. I don't see how I could survive this vibration. And I thought, knowing nothing of the body, this must be what they call a terrible hemorrhage. But I couldn't see how I could survive this vibration. Far from that, I began to wait. And I awoke as I have never been awake before, to find myself in my own skull. And I knew the skull was my skull, but I also knew it was a sepulchre. I knew it was a tomb. And it was hermetically sealed. There wasn't the slightest little opening in that tomb. And I had one consuming desire to get out. But I had a built-in wisdom as to what to do. I knew that if I pushed the base of my skull, that something would give. That I could push myself through it and come out. Well, I did. I pushed it. Something moved, leaving an opening. And I put my head against the opening and squeezed myself out, inch by inch by inch. And I came through that opening as a child comes through the womb of woman. And I pulled myself up. And when I came out, all the symbolism that we find in Scripture, especially in the book of Luke, surrounded me. The infant wrapped in swaddling clothes, three men to witness the event, and the most fantastic wind. It was a storm. And I interpreted the wind to be coming from the corner of the room, although I still felt it in my head. And one of the three who were present, he felt it, and he was the most disturbed of the three. They all felt the wind. He went to pick up, he went over to investigate the wind. And looking down, he saw the child, the infant wrapped in swaddling clothes. And he picked it up. And he looked into the little face, he announced what it was. And he said, it's Neville's baby. The other two in the most incredulous voices asked, how can Neville have a baby? But they couldn't see me. I was invisible to their eyes. I was so alive, so awake. I've never been awake like this before. I could read their every thought. Their thoughts were objective. I heard what they say, and their thoughts not yet expressed were objective to me. They couldn't conceal anything from him. And he brought the little infant and placed it on the bed. Then I took the infant up in my hand, and I said, looking into its face, how is my sweetheart? And the little child broke into the most heavenly lap. And then the whole thing dissolved. They dissolved, the room dissolved, the infant dissolved, and I found myself on the bed. With this fantastic, indelibly imprinted thing upon my mind. Got out and wrote the whole thing in detail and mailed it to my wife. Went down the hallway and dropped it in so that there'll be a record that the story of scripture is supernatural and it is not secular history. It's something that's going to happen to every person in this world in their own good order. But it is not something that happens only to one person. It's going to happen to all. It is God being born in man. That was his place to himself. And that man would actually become God. I was invisible to them. Why? Because God is spirit. But it didn't rob me of the feeling of the power and understanding and a wisdom that I did not enjoy when I wore the garment of flesh. Invisible to them. But I'm quite sure not invisible to the heavenly host. But they were not present. Only the three who came like the three shepherds come, and they saw it. And then, 139 days later, a vibration similar to that one started in my head, this time at the top of my skull. Again I thought, this is it. There's going to be an explosion within me. Well, there was. 
This time the whole thing exploded and when it all settled, standing before me is God's Son, not Jesus. David has told us in the Old Testament, as David said in the second psalm, I will tell of the decree of the Lord. He said unto me, Thou art my son, today I have begotten thee. Then he tells us in the 89th Psalm, I have found thee, with my holy oil I have anointed thee. And he shall cry unto me, Thou art my father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. I did not know, born and raised in the Christian faith, as I was, and call myself a Christian. My training did not reveal this at all, and here I see thee, and there is no uncertainty as to the relationship. I know he's my son, and I know that he knows I am his father. If I am his father, and he is God's son, well then, who am I? Every one of this world is going to awaken as God the Father. There's no room for anyone else in the universe but God. So God has transformed this wonderful creation into himself. And everyone will awaken as God the Father. So it's the story of Jesus. Jesus is God the Father. You want to see the Father? And I've been so long with you, Philip, and yet you do not know me. He who sees me has seen the Father. How then can you say, show us the Father? I and the Father are one. Yes, I and the Father are one. And the Father is greater than I. Because in the office of the saint, I am limited. But when I return to myself the Father, I am not in the office of the saint, but in the office of the sender. And the sender is greater than the saint, though they are one. So Jesus is not the Son, he is the Father. David is the Son. Did not David in the Spirit call him my Lord? And my Lord is simply the title that the Son always used to describe his Father. He always spoke of his Father as my Lord. And when I tell you it is David, it is David. No one in this world would ever, I would say, disprove it. He can deny it now, but he would have had the experience. And when you have the experience, you can't deny it. I could no more deny that experience than I could deny now the simplest evidence of my senses. I couldn't. It's indelibly impressed the mother. So all of these are supernatural events. And yet, man has been taught to believe they are part of secular history. It is not secular history. This being is born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So God became man, that man may be born as God. And because God is a father, if he's going to give himself to me 100%, then I must be a father. Not just a father, the father of another son, but no, that son. If he gives himself to me, tell me who are you, but he's a father. But what is your son's name? David. Well, if David is your son and you succeed in giving yourself to me, I must be. If you succeed, I must be David's father. And that would have happened to everyone in the world. Not one would escape it. For it is not God's will that one be lost. Can't be lost. So if you go through the furnaces, do not let anyone condemn you for it. And say it serves you right. Or this, that and the other. No. It is God's will. He passed through all the furnaces. But he did it for his own sake. For he could not give us himself until we are purified in the furnaces. And then he calls us out one by one. Not in pairs, you're too unique. You, not one person in the world can take your place. You are unique, the only one just like you. 
And so, in time, you're going to be called into the living temple. A living stone in the living temple, and the whole temple is God. So when we are told, the curtain was torn in two from top to bottom. And people looked in the synagogue for some curtain that was torn. How could it be when scripture tells us, ye are the temple of the living God, and the spirit of God dwells in you. If I am the temple of the living God, and the curtain of the temple is torn, it can't be something on the outside, made with human hands. It has to be the temple that I am. And that too is the one that is torn in two from top to bottom. You don't expect it. Suddenly, a bolt of lightning cut you in two from top to bottom. At the base of your spine, you'll see a golden pulsing liquid light. It lit. As you contemplate it, you are going to know it is yourself. And you're going to fuse with it. And then, like a fiery serpent, you're going to ascend into your own skull. But when you get there, it's going to reverberate like thunder. So you are, you're told the story in the third chapter of John. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. What did he lift up? A fiery serpent. And just as he lifted it up, all that to shadow. No fiery serpent was lifted up in any wilderness. All these other shadows, as we are told in the book of Hebrews, he was told to build it according to the reality. Build it according to the reality, but yours would only be a shadow. A shadow of the things to come. All this is beautiful imagery, but although the words are figurative, the truth is literal. When it happens to you, it will be literally true. Though, when you read it, the letters, the words used were pretty. Lifting up a serpent in the wilderness. No, it's all lifted up within you. That creative power within you that went down into generations will be reversed into regeneration and moved back up into heaven. For heaven is within you. And God is in his heaven. So the kingdom of God is within man. And a kingdom means a king. And the king is within. And you will rise within yourself. One with God. And you will play the part that you are predestined to play before that the world was. So this is a glorious day. If understood. A perfectly wonderful day. In fact, all the great events, but they're only shadows, and we are mistaken for the reality. And they're not. Now this psalm we quoted today, the 42nd psalm, is called a masculine. A masculine of call. The word masculine means in Hebrew, a special instruction. And Korah means reality. Truth. That which is really true. That which is real. So it's a special reality, or rather special instruction on truth, on reality. So this is a psalm that everyone should read and try to understand it. You who have heard it this night, take that with you when you read. For I'm telling you, the day will come. You too will lead them in procession. Don't think that never, and never alone, let them in day procession. No, you will play that part. And everyone will play that song. Everyone must lead them in procession to the house of God. And everyone will hear. And everyone will have someone on the side to question the outer voice. And then everyone leading them in procession is going to hear the inner voice coming only to them. I laid myself down within you to sleep. And as I slept, I dreamed the dream. I dream, and you are going to know without anyone coaching what the sentence means at the very end. He is dreaming that his eye is going to say to yourself. And then you're going to know what the crucifixion is. It's not painful, it's sheer ecstasy, may I tell you. And if the memory of it brings back to ecstasy, just imagine what the original was. For these things I remember. Well, if I can remember something, and become so ecstatic about it 
Just imagine what it was when in the beginning we were crucified with God. As Paul tells us, I have been crucified with God. And he confesses he never saw Christ Jesus after the flesh. He knows the whole drama was within himself. And because it took place within himself, he would not confer with flesh and blood. And all these are the great traditions put into historical form. And men now worship an external Jesus. When he is within. As you are told in scripture, do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless, of course, you fail to meet the test. And then he gives us the test. And the test is so very, very simple. And here is the test. You've had it several times tonight. And only you can judge whether you passed or failed. But I've given you the test many times. This comes from the fifth verse of the 13th chapter of 2 Corinthians. Test yourselves and see whether you are holding to the faith. Do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless, of course, you fail to meet the test. Now, you just heard the word Jesus Christ. He tells you in the beginning, he is in If the word Jesus, or the word Christ, or the word Lord, or the word God, or the word Jehovah, conveys the sense of some existence, something, external to yourself, you fail the death. You haven't yet found him within you. And I'll tell you, he is within you. Your own wonderful human imagination. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. So if on hearing these words you jump out and think of something external to yourself, existing, yes, but external to yourself, then you fail the death. As you walk the earth, you walk in the consciousness of being this one who so loved you, who became you. He is your own wonderful human imagination. Now you can test him in this way. If all things are possible to God, and he's within me, and he is my own wonderful human imagination, well, certainly I should be able to test that. I will now dare to pursue that I am the man that at the moment reason enough, and my senses deny. But who is doing it? Who is making the assumption? I am. That is me. And all things are possible to God. And he's just made an assumption. He is wearing this garment and responds to the name Neville. When someone calls the word Neville, he responds. But he is the reality that, is, that actually wears the garment. Now, I assume. Well, I am assuming that God is assuming. I am assuming that I am the man that I want. I know exactly what I want. Well, walk as though you were. That's all he asks of me. When you pray, believe you have received. And you will. Believe that you have. Not you're going to. Believe that you have. That's why I walk as though I have received. If I walk in the assumption that I am already the man that I want to be, Though reason denied and my senses denied, I should encounter that man. I should actually become that man, so that others can see I am that man. For well, now, try. Take a noble concept of yourself, something noble, something wonderful, something that you would like to live with. Assume that you are it, and walk as though you were. Speak as though you are, and then let the one within you, who so loved you that he became you, unfold you in that life. For eventually he's going to unfold you as himself. But in the meanwhile, in the world of Caesar, let him unfold you as the man, as the woman that you would like to be. Make it noble. Make it something lovely. Always use your imagination lovingly on behalf of others. And certainly on behalf of yourself. Nothing little, nothing that would take from any one of this world. Leave them just as they are. Don't rob them, leave them, think noble things of them. But for yourself, dare to assume something wonderful. And live in it just as though it were true. And I tell you from my own experience, 
it would be covered. 